warm greeting everyone education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world a famous quote by nelson mandela and with the striking motto of national education policy 2020 educate encourage and enlighten i dr poonam jain member of executive council iapt rc1 wholeheartedly welcome you all for the sixth online lecture organized by school of physical sciences jawaharlal nehru university and indian association of physics teachers the title for today's lecture is road map for implementation of national education policy 2020 i would first like to pay my sincere gratitude towards professor ajoy gatak the president national academy of sciences india and the former professor of physics at delhi for gracing us with his presence as chief guest on this auspicious event also i would like to welcome our renowned speaker of the day professor furkan kamal center for management studies jamia millia islamia new delhi and former vice chancellor central university of himachal pradesh also i would like to welcome all the other distinguished professor members of jawaharlal nehru university and indian association of physics teachers and our virtual audience present over here before we begin this is to inform you that this session is being recorded and streaming live on okay. youtube before proceeding ahead i request all the participants to mute their mics during the session for the smooth conduct of the event and drop your questions related to lecture in the chat box only without further ado now i request professor kedar singh the dean school of physical sciences jawaharlal nehru university for the welcome address and enlighten our audience about today's event over to you kedar sir thank you dr punam jain uh, good morning to all on the behalf of school of physical sciences and all uh, i welcome you in this sixth lecture series on national education policy 2020 implementation challenges and path ahead uh, as you know this lecture series is jointly organized by indian association of physics teachers and school of physical sciences jn i welcome and thank our professor ajay gathak president national academy of science india and former professor of physics iit delhi for his gracious presence and for proceeded remark uh, everybody know about bhatak he published more than 20 book on you know physics and Uh, this is the you know optics and you know uh, basics of quantum mechanics. Everybody, I think, some of you have studied. I have studied in the government. So this is what we have. So we are uh, very you know fortunate. Professor uh, Professor Ajay Gatta agreed uh, uh, to join here as a chief guest. And uh, yesterday I saw it. He he is really some emergency, but although he. Joined here, then we can understand uh, how he he want to do for this for for physics how he so works. Uh, thank you, sir, and most welcome to join you know this meeting and de definitely uh, we will benefit from your kind words. And uh, uh, now I am also grateful to Professor Farquhar. Kumar, <coughs> uh, the Center for Management Study, Jamia Millia Islamia, and former Vice Vice Chancellor, Central University, Madhya Pradesh, uh, for accepting our invitation uh, and delivering a very wonderful lecture on road map for implementation of any tweak to the tree. Thank you. Very much, sir. Thank you for uh, for accepting our invitation. I welcome our online team, 
not welcome the city they are working you know very hard to make it uh, this series successful this is our team is working you know for searching you know good speaker and this is the about what they are doing finally i welcome our faculty members colleagues students and participants those who are joining this lecture regularly i hope this lecture series can be to zero to zero or especially today lecture will be fruitful to understand the or you know this the motto any p to gps welcome you again over to you puno thank you sir thank you so much now i would like to request dr vijay k goyal school of physical sciences jawahar lal nehru university to introduce and invite our chief guest of the day professor ajoy ghatak sir for the presidential remarks over to you sir thank you punam ji am i audible yes yes yes, yes sir. you are audible thank you for giving me this opportunity to introduce the chief guest of this sixth meeting of online lecture series on nep 2020 jointly organized by sps jnu and iapt it's indeed a great pleasure for me to introduce the chief guest of today's uh, event professor ajoy ghatak who is a very well known personality and needs no formal introduction but since it's my responsibility it's, this responsibility is given to me so just to introduce him formally i would like to read out his brief bio data here professor ajoy ghatak is a renowned physicist he did his msc from delhi university and phd from cornell university with mark nelkin professor ghatak joined iit delhi in 1966 guided many phd students published more than 170 research papers and more than 20 books in 1995 professor ajoy ghatak was elected as the fellow of the optical society of america professor ghatak received many prestigious awards during his academic career shanti swarup bhatnagar award in 1979 galileo galilei award of the international commission of optics in 1998 Esther Hoffman Beller Medal of the Optical Society of America in 2003 Society of Photographic Engineers Washington USA SPIE Educator Award in 2008 and the Optical Society Sang Soo Lee <coughs> Award in 2020 Professor Ghatak superannuated as Emeritus Professor of Physics at IIT Delhi in 2007 and currently he is the president of national academy of science in india on behalf of organizing committee i would now welcome and invite professor ajoy ghatak for his presidential remarks over to you sir thank you thank you very much professor goel can i sh share my screen i have a few slides to show so... yes sir yes sir. can you see my first slide yes sir It's visible. Yes, sir. Professor Furkan Kumar, Kumar, Professor Manish Kashyap, Professor Aluwalia, Professor Kedar Singh, Professor Punam Jain, Professor Vijay Goel, and all other dignitaries present in this meeting. First of all, I would like to congratulate, express my hearty congratulations uh, for this tremendous effort by the Indian Association of Physics Teachers and. and jnu particularly the school of physical sciences for initiating this lecture series which which is of tremendous value to all concerned so i have been asked to speak for about 15 minutes i am very eagerly looking forward to professor kamar's lecture but before that i thought i will tell the younger people in the audience uh, a bit about our recent past You see, the first college in India was the Hindu College in Calcutta, which was the first institution of higher learning in the modern sense in Asia. It was formally opened on 20th January 1817, about 200 years back, with 20 scholars. The foundation committee of the college was headed by Raja Ram Mohan Rai, who, along with six others, donated their personal wealth. That is how the uh, Hindu College started, the first college in India. 
personal wealth to establish the college. And in 1855, as it, it was renamed as the Presidency College, where outstanding scientists, economists have graduated. And on 23rd July 2010, it became Presidency University. The pioneering contribution of people like Jagadish Chandra Bose and Prafulla Chandra Ray were made in the laboratories of, of Presidency College. Then in 1857, when we had the mutiny, British did something also very good. They established three universities on the similar to the structure of University of London. These universities were Madras University at Madras, Calcutta University at Calcutta, and Bombay University at Bombay. This is the, in my opinion, the starting point of the higher education. Although we had universities like Nalanda and Takshila 1500 years back, but the formal education of the type that we are trying to plan right now started in 1857. And then in 1869, a great visionary, Dr. Uh, Mahindralal Sarkar, wrote a paper in which he said the desirability of a national institution, remember the date, it is 1869, not 1969, desirability of a national institution for the cultivation of sciences by the natives of India, the great visionary and philanthropist, was a great philanthropist, Dr. Mahendralal Sarkar wrote that the prevailing backwardness of the country was due to backwardness of science and that the solution was in the vigorous pursuit of the sciences by original research. As I will try to tell you in the remaining slides, the, this is valid even today. And what Mahindralal Sarkar wrote was 150 years back or even a little more than that, that it, the prevailing backwardness of the country was due to backwardness of science. And he set up with personal donations he begged around because the British government will not give any money. The Indian Association for Cultivation of Sciences in Bhubajar Street in, in Calcutta, where he, he, this was created by personal donation, philanthropists. Today, we require in our country philanthropists who will create institutions. And today, IACS, the Indian Association for Cultivation of Science, is an institution of international repute. And in this, to earn money, uh, Mahindralal Sarkar would organize lectures by Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee, Jagadish Chandra Bosch, Pandit Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar, and, and, and take donations. The, the cost of attending a seminar at this association was one anna. Anna is one sixteenth of a rupee. And it is at this institute that C. V. Raman and K. S. Krishnan discovered what we now know as Raman effect, for which Raman got the Nobel Prize in 1930. So great experiments were done in that, uh, in that organization. Because of the scientific base that was created before, the, before our independence, our independence came in 1947, we have been able to achieve a lot. We have a flourishing and largely indigenous, no one will give the technology for nuclear energy in India. India has a flourishing and largely indigenous nuclear power program and expects to have 14.6 gigawatt electric nuclear capacity by 2024. And the architects of that was Homi Bhabha and Raja Ramanna. Now, Homi Bhabha was given a completely free hand to establish, to run the, to run the um, nuclear uh, energy program in India. And he started the Atomic Energy Commission soon after our independence. And people like Raja Ramanna continued it further because of which we have a flourishing indigenous people. Then we had people like Meghnath Saha who created a large number of institutions. And uh, I will name one. He, the fission process was discovered in 1938. And by 1941, when he was Polit Professor of Physics in Calcutta University, he started an institute of nuclear physics. Imagine the vision of this great man and which after Saha's death, became the Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics. He started, he, he, he was the founder president of the academy to which I now belong, uh, the National Academy of Sciences. He wrote an outstanding text on heat. He, he played a very important role in making Allahabad University a world-class institution. He created the Jadapur campus of the Indian Association for Cultivation of Science, and he created the uh, CGCR. There are many people like him who created large number of institutions of which we are all very proud of. Then we had people like Vikram Sarabhai and Satish Dhawan. 
the great Indian visionaries and founders of the space program. They were also given a free hand and to develop this program. Today, uh, because of the untiring efforts of people like Dr. Abdul Kalam, uh, the ISRO created a world record by sending 104 satellites in a single rocket. This is a tremendous technical achievement in our country. Then we had the Green Revolution by Professor Swaminathan. Then we had the White Revolution. When I came back from, from, uh, from USA in 1964, immediately after a postdoctoral fellowship, milk was not available, 1964. Milk was not available. In, uh, I mean, I had to stand in a line for, for sometimes for an hour to get an additional bottle of milk. But the, but the milk revolution was possible because of one individual, Dr. Varghese Kurian. And then our prime minister has the target of installing 20 gigawatts of solar power by 2022, and which was achieved four years ahead of schedule. So we are planning. So very soon we are hoping, and I hope I live to see that, that every village in our country it gets electrified. Then we have the boom in information technology. India has about 1.2 billion mobile phones. Now a person sitting in Delhi can transfer money to a person in Tamil Nadu or Bihar or Orissa uh, through his mobile phone. This is an incredible revolution that has happened, which has improved the poorest of the poor, poorest of the poor. And then we have, we are also the world's largest vaccine manufacturer and took a multi-million dollar pandemic gamble. Serum Institute of India and other institute is the world's largest vaccine producing company in the world's largest vaccine producing nation. So this is also a tremendous achievement that we have made. We have achieved so much, but then the poverty still remains. 30% of our population is still below the poverty line. Slavery, this is the slavery in a brick manufacturing company in India. And I would urge all of you to watch this Beautiful video clip in, in YouTube by Lisa Christine. Entire families can be carrying bricks or stones from morning to evening in extreme. This is present even today. And this is, as you know, in nation's capital, the many uh, manual scavengers died in the sewers of Delhi. So we still are a poor nation. When 30% of the population that is a staggering 400 million people still live below the poverty line. And when I see this photograph, then I feel that, that all my life I have been in education. There is something which needs to be done drastically. And uh, so we live in different difficult times with peace and human security are facing new challenges at the individual and global level. Education is the key dimension of the long-term process of building peace, tolerance, justice, and intercultural understanding. The reorientation of education to create a better world is truly urgent. This was by, told by DG of UNESCO. So the solution for the removal of the poverty of this country is education, science, and technology. And so therefore the emphasis and the understanding of our new education policy is of extreme importance. However, in, in the just few days back, we have started, we saw in the newspapers this, this uh, common university entrance test. Now, it is going to so solve part of the problem. But the main problem is, think of these young men and women, young boys and girls who are coming out of the school. I have been associated with the higher education program in the college and university, so I will not go into the school. But imagine a student at the plus two level, how many examinations will he appear in? He has a CBSE, he has a JE, he has now CUET, he has uh, NEET. So, kitne lo, kitna prepare kare ye? so it is a good, good thing that it has started. But what is more important is that even then, Outstanding students will not be able to get into the, because the numbers are so high, will not be able to get into the, the, the campus colleges, even in Delhi University. The cutoff marks will be even then, even now, 99%. In our days, we never appeared, in, I, I grew up in independent India. And I never had a, uh, to appear in a entrance examination because of the marks in the UP board or Delhi University examination, I could get admission in any place. Uh, as 
So I just had to have a first class or something like that. Imagine now, now the competition has become so severe. So what is the solution to the problem? The solution to the problem is that we have to create 100 such colleges. And so it is not that difficult to get into that college and maybe have a, a reasonable, uh, reasonable uh, tuition. Like we saw, I recently saw in uh, uh, Gautam Buddha University in Greater Noida. It has a sprawling campus. It has, uh, it, it, it now takes a little bit of money from there and it is a completely self-run institution, although it is a government institution, although it is a government. You cannot leave, you cannot leave education and health completely to the private sector. The government has to give the opportunity all these young students to have the forum for, for taking the courses that the person wants. I will almost conclude with this photo, which came out in the latest issue of the India Today. I see this, I look at the eyes of this young man. He is 28-year-old Rakesh Pal. He appeared in the cover of India Today last week. He's a BSc, maybe BSc honors in chemistry and has not been able to find a job. He applied for a clerk's position in, in Indian Railways. There were 38,000 uh, jobs, 38,000. And guess how many applications were there? As you can see on the bottom of the photograph, 125 lakhs. So where is his chance? Now, it's a very iconic photograph. The more I see, I feel I have been an educationist myself, that where have we gone wrong? I, I personally feel we have, what we have to think of the future is not only to change the curriculum, but also to see, make our graduates employable, number one, and make a large number of institutions like IITs, like Delhi University, like Central Universities and things like that, so that there is not such a, such a great competition to get into the economics program of Delhi University or to the uh, physics program at uh, uh, Delhi University or Calcutta University. So these are my uh, <laughs> offhand uh, observations and I remain very concerned I remain very concerned because of the fact that uh, when I did my MSc or when I came back from USA after my PhD, getting a job was not a problem. Getting a job was not a problem. The salaries were very low. I, my first take home salary was around 900 to 1000 rupees, but getting a job was not that much a problem. Today, getting a permanent job, today Delhi University colleges have have, have hundreds of temporary appointments. Now, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. What will the young children see and about their own future? So, so I think a gross ex the government has to take a major responsibility in, in education and health, which is taking, which is, which is taking. And, uh, and uh, I now very eagerly look forward to this lecture by Professor Kamar, uh, who I know as when he was the vice chancellor of Central University of Mahachatra. Thank you, Poonam. Thank you, Dr. Tukasi. It was really wonderful. You have uh, uh, given us the information about so old universities. That's wonderful. You have bright ideas and comforting guidance has a great positive impact on our audience. Indeed, your words have inspired us a lot, sir. Thank you so much. Now I request Dr. Alok Jha, School of Physical Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University, to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Farhan Kamar, Center for Management of Islamia Over to you, Alok sir. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Poonam. And uh, uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, we are, here we have a very prominent professor, uh, Professor Raja Ghotak, is a very well known. Still, uh, we Whenever we uh, go through the book of optics, we first prefer the, you know, uh, Professor Ghatak book, right? So he's a well-known personality in, uh, all around the world, not in Delhi University or JNE, everywhere. And I also welcome uh, uh, Professor Kedar Singh Ji, uh, Professor Manish Ji, and Professor uh, Furkan Kamar, right? So 
uh, it's my pleasure to you know uh, give a, a introduction uh, although this uh, his uh, furkan kamar is a well known personality and uh, uh, i will just uh, introduce himself and dr furkan kamar is presently a professor of management at the center of management studies jamia millia islamia new delhi he has served as the secretary general of the association of indian universities <laughs> aiu the largest and one of the oldest network of university in the world in his illustrious career dr kamar has held the position of the vice chancellor of the university of rajasthan and the central university of himachal pradesh he has also served as the advisor education in the planning commission of india essentially a professor of management he has keen research interest in public policy planning administration and a uh, financing of higher education and has a numerous publications <coughs> in journals of repute to his credit professor kamar uh, has chaired and been member of a large number of committees working groups at the national and international level dr kamar thus brings him uh, you know with him excel uh, academic uh, eminence leadership qualities and exposure to the best uh, you know <laughs> global practices so i warmly uh, welcome uh, dr uh, you know furkan kamar please thank you thank you very much to you all the distinguished members on the panel uh thank you very much professor pk alwalia sahab for asking me to speak uh, to the distinguished august gathering participants of this program although you had asked me to speak much earlier but then somehow it could be uh, fixed on this uh, day though you earlier wanted me to be on 19 but somehow i am busy so my apologies for this but i am so very happy that i am in your midst i am particularly privileged that this program is being chaired by professor ajoy ghatak professor ghatak was a distinguished member of the university court at the central university of himachal pradesh and we benefited from his ideas uh, a kind of innovative approach and thinking about education and its concerns for making education relevant to the immediate needs of the society and economy and he has always been a champion of the public sector in higher education so i feel privileged to be sharing my thought on the national education policy thank you very much professor ghatak for being or for agreeing to chair this session uh i also thank professor kedar singh professor vijay goel sahab punam jain ji alok jha sahab manish kashyap sahab uh for being here on this panel and all the distinguished member i think uh, it was good that professor ghatak spoke uh, in the very beginning because he set the true context in which we should be seeing the national education policy india doesn't have a dearth of talents it never had the real question has been that how to use this talent how to put this talent to the best use i recently wrote a piece when these many uh, ukrainian uh, medical student indian students are studying in ukraine came back to india and there were issues and questions as to how to accommodate them and then i collected some information and wrote a piece and what i found was that every year almost 16 lakh students apply for medical education and 50% being the cut off and the qualifying marks almost 8 lakhs plus students are found eligible suitable qualified to pursue medical education we are able to admit only 83000 within our country and of this 83000 only 
about 42, 43,000 are in the public medical college, government medical college. The rest are in private medical college. So a large number of people who aspire to do medical education are qualified enough and are eligible enough to pursue medical education. They are denied. Some 10,000 choose to go to abroad, uh, either because they could not make it to government colleges and could not afford the fees of the private institutions, or they simply could not make the cutoff list, but the rest keep on trying for a couple of years, and then they give up their dreams of becoming a doctor. And that is when we have shortage of medical doctors within our country. We are still not meeting the norms, though we claim that we have already met the WHO norm, but recently we came across a data where they are saying that the list of the medical registry includes people who have already either passed away or have stopped their practice or have left their practice. And therefore the real number is nearly half of what the medical registry mentions. So this is just one example that what a huge talent we have and how effective have we been, have we been in using this talent. Coming to the national education policy, which is the topic of the day and the road for implementation, uh, I think by now uh, uh, people must have uh, memorized by heart the content of the national education policy. And given that this program is attended by all the eminent scientists and people with the scientific temperament, I'm sure that they must have all analyzed the possibilities and the pitfalls and the potentials of this policy. So please excuse me if I do not add anything new to what people already know, but I'll try to do my little bit on these challenges that you are saying for the implementation of the new education policy. Please allow me to share my screen and uh, take you through my understanding of the national education policy. Uh, Uh, is the uh, is screen visible? Yes, sir. It's okay. visible. Okay, thank you. And before I give my ideas and understanding of the national education policy, let me put a few caveat. Uh, because these days when I listen to people, I often come across with many points which I do not find officially in the document of the national education policy. And probably the reason is that there are many versions and many documents that are available. So the oldest that you could say is about the Kasturi, uh, sorry, about the Subramaniam committee report, which was in 2016. It was supposed to be a draft of the national education policy but then the Ministry of Human Resource Development then used this as some input of or some input on the national education policy. So obviously this is not a policy. Then we had Kasturi Rangan committee. The report of this committee was named at draft NEP and which was, sorry, there is a typing mistake. It was in 2019. And this Kasturi Rangan committee was almost of 500 pages. And this not only indicated about what needs to be done, what are the requirements, but it had also given a detailed roadmap and targets for every recommendation that Kasturi Rangan committee had met and also the datelines by which those targets should be achieved. Finally, however, this report was reduced into much a smaller number of words. And then there are many versions. 
So there is a 136 page version. There is a 71 page version. There is a 60 page version. There is 108 page Hindi version. But whatever I am uh, speaking is based on this 66 page final version, which was uploaded as an approved version by the cabinet on the Ministry of Human Resource Development and later on Ministry of Education website and which I believe is, is still available. So my whole basis for the discussion is this document and not any other document because I think that the rest of the documents don't mean anything now. Earlier, I used to think that maybe the Kasturi Rangan Committee report would be used for translating the policy into action. But then later on, I found that there are new ways of thinking and universities are being asked and people are being consulted as to how to implement the policy. It means we are not going in the way in which the Kasturi Rangan Committee wanted us to go or the roadmap or the target that it has given. Let me uh, also set uh, the larger context very briefly about uh, the uh, in which we need to see the policy in terms of its content and in terms of its implementation policy. What should be goal of higher education? And I think Professor Ghatak's initial presentation were very, very remarkable. And I think that explains in a much better words than I could say that not only that you are seeing these education as an instrument for your economic gain, but you are also seeing it as a means of national development and serving the humanity by and large. Uh, we can't stand to gain much if uh, people receive education and remain unemployed, either because uh, our curricula is old, our pedagogy is incomplete, or we do not provide relevant education. Or it could also be that economy is not creating enough jobs, and therefore there is a huge gap between what we produce, the job seekers, and what the economy offers to the young people for whatever reason. So we need to do something. Personally, I believe that the solution for that problem lies at the educational institutions level, as far as quality is concerned, but it also lies at the larger economic level where you need to uh, focus on such industries and the way of industries where you could be efficient and at the same time, you do not take away the job. Also the per capita income and everything would become meaningless. Two trillion or five trillion economy may not mean much if people do not benefit from that. So I think inequitable distribution of income and wealth and we have seen that after globalization, the inequity has increased. COVID pandemic has exposed us to this situation. Now in a nation of 130 crore, if we have to distribute free ration to about 80 crore of people, otherwise they would not be able to survive or they would be forced to drink water the way one of the photographs of Professor Ghatak showed, that the child was drinking water, perhaps our development would not mean anything. So education should also be focused uh, and uh, uh, towards the overall holistic development. Very quickly, uh, without taking much time, there have always been since independence and even before independence, there were three challenges which I always define in terms of three E's. We need to expand our system of higher education to accommodate ever increasing demand for higher education. 
in india people value education and they want to provide their children to as much education as they can afford to and therefore the system should be ready to provide them education not all kinds of education but quality education also the expansion would not come unless we are exclusively focused on inclusion so for example today the participation rate in higher education is only about 27 to 28% but for people like us who are speaking from the dais or probably most of them who are participating in this program for you and your children the participation rate in higher education must be more than 100 which is 20% higher than the united states average so for people with mean people with the uh, earlier education a higher education for their children is not a problem but if you pick up a person who lives in a rural area is a woman is landless is a cultivator then for their children access to higher education would be less than 2% so it is our 100% and their 2% which provides the weighted average of about 27%. So I think inclusiveness and equity is very, very important. So that is the second E that we need to focus. And the third thing is that if we make it equitable and we expand system, but if we do not focus on quality, then the whole purpose becomes meaningless. Although there are many meanings and connotation of quality, some people link it only with employability some people would say that no education has many more and rather much higher purposes than merely providing jobs so i think we need to be clear as to which combination of the purpose and objectives of higher education we need to follow but anyway the quality and excellence we cannot ignore now, in this quick backdrop, if you see the approach of this national education policy, and I think that would be very important uh, for its implementation. So it claims to make India as a global knowledge superpower. So that is very progressive statement. It also wants to make or transform India into equitable knowledge society through high quality education for all. And if you could relate it, these two, three things are very similar or maybe taken from the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. But at the same time, the policy says that it will be rooted in ancient India. And the focus seems to have become Indian ethos and culture ancient knowledge, tradition, culture, values. And when you look at the draft, it appears that perhaps post Vedic period, nothing happened in the field of higher education, which of course, Professor Ghatak explained to us that how much did the nation do and individuals in the nation do for the nation, for the world, for the science, and not only in sciences across all disciplines, uh, of uh, knowledge uh, during all these periods. So you cannot ignore even the colonial periods or medieval Indian periods, although I do not say that in ancient India things were not at all good. There were many things which we need to uh, emulate, which we need to continue, uh, but I think we cannot undermine uh, what had happened during the rest of the period. Professor Ghatak mentioned about the three uh, presidential universities that were set up. Uh, that was in 1857 and 1857 was the mutiny year when Indians were revolting against uh, British. And uh, we call it as first war of independence. And during the course of my research, I had the occasion and opportunity to read the debates 
that was taking place in British Parliament about establishing universities. And there was one group of MPs which were saying on the one hand, they are revolting against us. And on the other hand, and most of the people uh, who are talking about freedom, et cetera, they have been either aspiring to or have received education in our universities. And on the other hand, you want them to educate more. The more you educate, the more quickly they would want more freedom. But you know that the dominant view there was that you can't keep any nation as a colony forever. One day or the other, they will demand and get independence. And at that time, we would not want to be known as a nation that kept those people illiterate or that kept those people awake. So I think uh, we need to give due credit, although I do not want to uh, eulogize. There were many limitations of uh, the colonial time. Now, I would specifically mention two targets and come to some of the more uh, uh, substantive dimensions of the education policy. So this national education policy says or fix a targets that by 2040, India shall have an education system which is second to none in the whole world. And I thought a lot about this. And then I found that there could be three dimensions to this statement. One is that India could be second to none in terms of the number of higher educational institutions. So I must mention, and probably you already know, that more than 1,000 universities around 49,000 colleges, 10,000 standalone institutions. So with these numbers, India is already the largest system, not only one, but the largest system of higher education found anywhere in the world. No other country has as many institutions. Not even regional groupings of the country have as many institutions as India has. So on the first count, we don't need to wait till 2040. We have already met this target. Second dimension of this statement could be that India can have the largest number of people pursuing higher education than anywhere in the world. And I must mention that already we are the second largest country in the world, which has so many people pursuing higher education. There are only 40 countries in the world which have more population than the student population in our higher education. Just 40 countries. The remaining 160 countries have population of much lesser than our enrollment in higher education. We used to be number three but now we have already displaced United States of America. China is the only competitor and the way the Chinese demographics are changing, we will soon be displacing China. And I'm sure that by 2040, we shall become second to none in terms of the number of enrollment as well. Now there is a third dimension and this third dimension is the quality that we should be second to none in terms of quality and excellence. And that is one dimension that keeps all of us worried. Our research output, our impact factors, our number of uh, world-class institutions within the country, or the fact that there are some where the cutoff goes as high as 100%, and still you are not sure that you will get admission, comments a lot that right from Manipur and Meghalaya to Delhi, that speaks about the quality of the institutions that are there in those regions. On the other hand, if you look at the total number of students who pass from the school boards 
and the total number of intake capacities, you'll find that we have created intake capacity of almost for 85% people. Still, this demand supply mismatch speaks about demand for very good high quality of education and dearth of high quality institution within our country. So it is on this third factor that we have to focus a great deal. Uh, so it is in this backdrop that we need to see that what the policy suggests and what are the challenges before the nation. Uh, there are many things, although the document is only of about 66 pages, but there are many things in that. So I have focused only on some of the more important and the structural reforms. So uh, one reform that we saw is about funding. I'm particularly happy and you all must be happy that this policy said that or reiterated at least that the government is committed to spend at least 6% of the GDP in higher education. In which time frame, we do not know. Uh, it is not mentioned. And you would know that this was a target that was set by Kothari Commission in 1966. And the nation had agreed to this commitment in 1968, but still we have reached to only 3% of the GDP. So that means doubling the total public investment in higher education by the central and state government put together, but we are far away from this target. But in the meantime, very importantly, this policy says that private higher educational institution would be treated at par with public institutions. No distinction between private and public. And then they are saying that these private institutions have to meet only two conditions. One is the philanthropic. They have to be philanthropic in character and they have to be public spirited. I actually do not understand the meaning of uh, public spirited but I think that they should uh, work and behave like uh, public institutions work and behave in terms of employment, in terms of admissions, in terms of uh, fees structure. So uh, the emphasis is new, but I think uh, the legal framework within our country is that all educational institutions, public or private, school or higher education, they are all charitable societies or charitable trust, they can't make profits. So they are that way philanthropic in character. Uh, I think uh, by and large, they are not public spirited because the reservation, etc., may not apply to them. They may oppose to that idea for many reasons. Another thing which this policy talks about is the liberal scholarships. And when this is mentioned, the idea that comes to mind is that probably there would be support from the government to provide scholarships to the needy section. So the needy in terms of the social and economic. There are reservation ideas. There are ideas uh, about the student loan program. Is there any... Uh, Salwalia, any issues, any problems? I could hear some background noise. No. Okay. So no, no, no. Please continue, sir. I thought that maybe. So, uh, but then uh, some of the experiences of the IITs, etc., say that where the scheduled caste, OBCs, scheduled tribes are not to pay fees or pay less fees these institutions are being required to meet the additional cost out of their own budget. So meaning a kind of cross subsidization is entering into picture. Loan schemes are very popular in case of IIMs, even in IITs. 
focus is shifting on enhanced cost recovery. So say for example, the centrally funded institutions now do not get developmental grants. What they get is a HIFA loan, higher education funding agency loan. And these loans are repayable. Although for all institutions, the interest burden has been borne by the government. And depending on the type of university, the policy said that some will be required to return 100% but most would be required to repay only 10% of the loan that they have taken over a period of 10 years. So, but anyway, adding this 10% to many institution and recovering them from cost and particularly from a student could be one challenge or one problem area. Initially, the Kasturi Rangan committee had said that in addition to the existing funding by UGC, DST, DBT, uh, CSIR, ICHR, there would be a national research foundation. But the way it has been implemented, it seems that all the money that was flowing for research has been pooled or is being pooled in the national research foundation. And therefore the research has become competitive. And in this research, the public and the private, they shall both be beneficiary. They can both access these funds. One thing uh, which is uh, somewhat disquieting for people like me, that funding has been linked to excellence. So if you attain excellence, you will get more funds. So become institutions of eminence, you will get say 1000 crore. If you are uh, not attaining excellence, then your funding is limited or you are not eligible to funding. So like you saw in some states under RUSA that you become accredited only then you will get the funding. Sometimes what happens is that you need funds to improve your infrastructure. You need to have more faculty only then you can improve excellence. So that way it's a kind of chicken and egg story. So, but saying that first to attain excellence may adversely impinge on a large number of institutions, particularly those which are located in the rural areas and others. Then there are, we have thought that this regulatory reform would come first and then the rest would follow. Right from the National Knowledge Commission, which had submitted its report in 2007, every commission, every committee has been talking about that multiplicity of the regulatory bodies are a challenge. And therefore we need to do away with, we need to have a single regulator. Jashpal committee also said the same thing, although using a different argument. Uh, National Knowledge Commission's argument was that multiplicity creates barrier, entry barriers and uh, operations barrier. So a free market model required a single regulatory mechanism. Yashpal committee's idea was that this multiplicity in fact divides knowledge. Uh, his idea was that whatever you could invent in the core of a discipline has already been invented and now new knowledge and new invention are being created by intermingling of disciplines. So if you want the boundaries between the discipline to be porous, if you want to take out disciplines from their silos, then you need a single regulatory body. So those were the kind of argument which Shashpal committee had. Even administrative reforms commission at that time we spoke about the single regulatory system. This committee and this education policy also talks about and very clearly mentions that there shall be a single regulatory commission, HESI. And HESI shall have, or HECI shall have four verticals. One would be to regulate higher education called higher education regulatory councils. So UGC, AICT, they will not be there, but there would be another council. Then there would be accreditation council, but but it is not to be confused with the NAC or NBA, 
this council's job would be to provide license to many agencies to accredit institutions of higher education. Most importantly, there is supposed to be a standard setting body, the General Education Council. And the idea was that all professional bodies uh, like uh, AICT, Council of Architecture, Pharmacy Council, they will all become standard setting bodies and they will become member of the General Education Council and they will set standards for their discipline, for their profession and for the practice of their profession. And that input would then be used for the regulation and for the accreditation and a funding or higher education grant councils. We had thought that this regulation would come first and in a consultative process through standard setting bodies, through general education council, we shall have more thorough understanding of where things need to change. But somehow it has not happened so far. Twice in the budget statements during the last two years, it was mentioned that this year, the regulation, Higher Education Commission of India would come, act would come, it has not come. Even in this year's budget, it did not come. So third year, it did not come. Maybe there is a second thinking or maybe there are some serious complications in conceptualizing the idea. Since the title was to uh, implementation challenges, so I think right from National Knowledge Commissions until this national education policy, everybody assumed that regulatory bodies do not function well. There are limits. In fact, I published a paper where I found that uh, the quality of higher education is inversely proportional to the intensity of regulation. Because in India, uh, there have been various phases in the higher education development and there have been phase when there were no regulation and two, we came to a phase when there were multiple regulations. So the regulation intensified. So the data proved that intensity of regulation in fact works against promotion of quality and excellence. So no doubt about it, that the kind of regulatory framework that we had did not work. It neither promoted excellence nor stopped poor bad quality institutions or malpractices in the institutions to check. But then every committee assumed that that need to be replaced by a new body as if there was a design defect in the regulatory body's structure. Problem is that an institution can fail not only because there is or not necessarily always because there is a design defect. And in fact, we have seen this in starting from 88, 89, after the last education policy, we said that UGC has failed to provide effective regulation to technical education, to management education, to pharmacy education, to fine art education, and All India Council for Technical Education, the Council for Distance Education, National Council for Teacher Education, they all came into existence. And we found that many of those institutions were proven worse than the University Grants Commission. So assumption was that there was a design defect and new institution would address that design defect. But we do not know where lies that design defects. And therefore we design a new institution which has not necessarily taken care of that design defects. You are all scientists and physicists who would know it better. But then institutions also fail because of the people who are at the helms or at the part of the, those institutions. Same institution could work well if you are somehow able to change people. 
Third reason could be that the institution could operate in a specific context. And this context does not allow many regulations to work properly. So say for example, the sociologist and we in management or psychologists know that the Western societies are individualistic societies. And in individualistic societies and full employment economy particularly, they are more merit oriented. They do not go as much by recommendations and other factors uh, in the selection of the teachers and the students, etc. Compared to that in Asia, in India, in Bangladesh, in many other countries, we are a kind of familial societies where a family network plays a very, very important role. Sometimes this family network, you could say it in the caste way, or sometimes you could define it in a community way, sometimes you could define it in a religious way. So they play an important role. Once I was making a similar kind of presentation, so people say that in India, you also have this Tau phenomenon. You could, in fact, say no to your father. Okay, father, uh, I'm holding this position of responsibility, but sorry, I cannot uh, uh, take care of the person whom you are recommending. But it is extremely difficult to say so to the elder brother of your father. So we are a different context. This means the models which have worked elsewhere may not necessarily work elsewhere. Problem is, the design defects we do not know where lies. People you cannot change. Even if you remove all the people who are part of an institution and pick other sets of people, since the pool is the common, so the probability of the similar kind of people being part of those organizations is very, very strong. So you can't change people in the long run. The only factor that could change people is the quality, training, skills, knowledge, uh, values. But then it's again a chicken and egg story. Good educational institution would be able to do that. But to be able to do that, you need a good regulator. Uh, even the social context in which you exist, you cannot change in the short run. Society changes much longer time uh, to change. We know from our own history of the social reformers that how much struggle they had to make to bring in a small reform. So what can become then critical is streamlining your processes and systematizing your processes and making your processes so systematic that the scope of the discretion, etc., is eliminated in totality scope of multiple interpretation could be uh, interpreted. Uh, it could be uh, minimized lately. So I think these have been the things. So I'm sure that they might be finding it difficult to design a new generation institution, which they thought would be easy. They also say that, okay, all the boards should be autonomous. So they are talking about autonomy of higher educational institutions. In fact, uh, IIM Act shows a model. IIT Act also to a large extent is not under University Grants Commission, is uh, directly under the Ministry of Education, but is largely run by its own board or the council of the IITs. They are or this policy is talking about that gradually give autonomy to institutions so that all the decisions are taken at the board level. Initially, it was said generally, but now I think these are being circumscribed by the parameters of quality. So they are saying that not to all institutions, but to quality institutions. Uh, so more clarity needs to emerge on this. And lastly, that they are mentioning in terms of the regulatory things that we need to do away with prior approval from the regulatory bodies. Rather, the regulation should be based on norms, standards, and then disclosures. 
So you set a norm, institutions are required to follow those norms and disclose them fully. And if they have disclosed something which is wrong, which is inaccurate, then only the action would follow it. So it's a similar kind of arrangement that we had earlier about the control over capital issue, that all companies needed to come from Mumbai to Delhi to Udyog Bhavan to seek prior approval for everything. And then later on, the SEBI came, where it became the disclosure based. Now, critically, I think uh, people these days are busy. Many guidelines have come for restructuring the institutions and restructuring the programs. Uh, how much time do I have, uh, Alwale Sahib or Manish Ji? Uh, sir, you can take 20 minutes from the Great. Uh, am I thank audible, you. sir? Sure, sure, sure. So thank you very yeah. much. So, so now uh, this policy says that affiliation system is a bane. And this we have been saying in our country since... Sadler Commission report, that was the Calcutta University Education Commission report. That is 1913 or so, or maybe before that. That affiliation system is not a good system. Uh, even pre-independence time, there was a realization, as I said, that those who came to visit universities to India, they said, you no, know, this affiliation system uh, seriously hampers quality. And after that, almost every commission and every policy said that the affiliation system is bad. Bad in the sense that it burdens universities with conducting examinations and admissions for all the colleges which are affiliated and thereby distracting them from their core functions of teaching and research. And on the other hand, the colleges suffer, particularly the good colleges suffer because they are bound to follow the curricula and the pedagogy and the examination system, evaluation system which the university prescribes so they cannot do innovation. And there happens some kind of standardization or uniformity or formalization. And the more you try to standardize uh, a system, rather than it improving the system, it pulls down the system to a common denominator. So it, they have been saying that affiliation system is pulling down the system and lowering the quality. But nobody earlier said that affiliation system should be abolished in one go. They all said that there are too many. They are the main state. Even today, 78% of the students study in colleges. And uh, there is a misunderstanding that colleges provide only undergraduate education. It's wrong. 65% of the postgraduate education is provided in colleges. And there are colleges of many sizes. There are colleges of just 100 students. And there are colleges which are bigger than the university to which they are affiliated. But this policy said that do away with these colleges. By 2035, all institutions would be regrouped, recategorized into these three categories. You become a research university, or you become a teaching university, or you become an autonomous higher educational institutions. And the research university would be the one where teaching would happen but the primary focus of teachers and research scholars would be on research, publication, patent, intellectual property rights, and their evaluation criteria, their accreditation criteria would also be based on that. Perhaps they had Indian Institute of Sciences as a role model in this regard, or maybe JNU or University of Hyderabad. Uh, or some of the state universities, Jadapur. Uh, then the second teaching universities, they would also 
engage in research, but their primary focus would be on graduate outcome, the kind of graduate that they produce. Do they become employable? Uh, do they progress in their career? Do they, so their evaluation and assessment criteria would be different. And is starting from last year, the NIRF ranking already has a separate category of research universities. And they have already specified parameters in terms of uh, uh, number of research scholars and the total number of publications, et cetera, which will determine that whether you are a teaching university or a research university. Other than these, all other colleges, standalone institutions, they are conceptualized to become autonomous higher educational institution in the sense that they will be awarding degrees in their own names. So all the colleges of Delhi University or Calcutta University or uh, uh, any other Madras University, they will become autonomous. Now, many of the colleges which are very good that we already know when they sit in the interview committee and you ask a student from where have you done your uh, education? So if he has done from a quality college, he mentions the name of the college. I am from Stephens, I am from Presidency, I am from Loyola. And if he's not from one of the prestigious colleges, so for perceived prestigious colleges, then he takes the name of the university. I am from Delhi University, I am from Calcutta University, I am from Patna University. So those colleges would be very happy. And Professor Ghatak already gave example that this Hindu college first became presidency college and then later on it became a presidency university. Uh, there are other examples also. Bishop Cotton College became Cotton University. There could be other examples and many other. Uh, in Bangalore, for example, some colleges were separated from Bangalore University and a cluster was formed and they became a Bangalore Central Cluster University. Other colleges, there would be a problem. Nobody knows them. They are either single discipline colleges or they are too small. They are too poor in their academic and physical infrastructure. Those who study there may have serious problems. And keeping that in mind, the National education policy says that you need to resize and upsize all educational institution and make them all multidisciplinary. So the idea is that no institution would be single disciplinary. Jashpal committee has also said this. Kasturi Rangan did not give any argument. He only gave the argument of preparing a holistic focus on with liberal science, liberal arts. So they said, okay, let every college increase to a size of a minimum of 3,000 students. Now, presently, only a very small proportion of the colleges, and that data is available in AISHE report, I do not recall, but I think more than 77% colleges have less than three, I think more than that, have less than 3,000 enrollment. And bulk of the colleges, more than 60, 70% colleges, have about less than 1,000 enrollment. 20% of them have less than 200 enrollments. So they are challenged to raise their number of enrollments. How could you raise the enrollment of uh, students? Either you add more sections, you add more programs, you add more optionals, you add more electives. And for that to happen, you need infrastructure. For that to happen, you need teacher. And that could be possible only when you become a multidisciplinary institutions. So the policy's focus is on becoming all institution multidisciplinary. Jashpal committee had also said this. So there will not be only exclusive uh, teacher colleges, but they will be part of a larger college system, which will have humanities, social sciences, arts, uh, sciences, 
and also teacher education. Similarly, standalone management institutes perhaps would not serve the purpose. You need to add more disciplines. Management education, by the way, by nature is multidisciplinary, but then the degree is only one. Uh, similarly, just an arts college, just a science college, just a commerce college would not serve the purpose. You all have to imbibe all disciplines simultaneously. And then the policy talks about where would lie the major implementation challenge that if you want to do yourself and if your physical infrastructure and your financial condition permit, you become a university. So like presidency became a university, like uh, Xavier Institute of Management became the Xavier University. Like a long time ago, much before the policy, the Christ Management Institute became became a Christ University in Bangalore. So become a university. Many are contemplating this idea, even within Delhi or in all towns. If you cannot become a university, become a multidisciplinary college, adding more disciplines, but award degree in your own name. So say for example, if there are colleges located in Knowledge City, I would say so in many cities. So let them all come together and form a cluster and give a name to that university. So let a students take science in one college, commerce in another college, some other courses of communication, etc. in another one, they are in the immediate vicinity and get the degree from that university. So this is the idea. Third idea is that if you cannot do, you consolidate yourself. So different colleges are merged together. That has led to anxieties amongst college people. And if that is also not possible, then face the closer. And therefore, somewhere in the policy, there is a hint that the total number of higher educational institution in the country this way shall have about 1,500 degree awarding institutions. Presently, there are only 1,095 degree awarding institutions. The rest are non-degree awarding institutions. So you need to reduce it to a number of 1,400, either through merger or consolidations or closure or cluster and reduce it to 1,500 and let them award degrees. So this regulatory structure would enable these kind of institutional change that has been the assumptions. And then they said that the programs offered by various institutions also need to be restructured. So they said that the essential idea of the institution being multidisciplinary is that all programs also need to become multidisciplinary. So let them all study many different subjects. Professor Ghatak have been um, in US. Uh, since then, a lot of change, or maybe even at that time there was there, but since then, some of the best or most institutions in the United States today have four-year undergraduate program. And they have a policy that for two years, let the students swim across the campus, go from department to department and take a course from here, take a course from there, and let them have a feel of the wide variety of knowledge that exists on the campus. And in this two years time, they also in this process discover themselves and their fascinations and their interest. And for the remaining two years, they dive deep into a discipline. So swim across and dive deep. I think that is the idea when this policy says that become multidisciplinary institutions. So that is not to abolish discipline, that is not to abolish a degree from the physics, but let the physicist also know something about other things. Or let's say management people know something about physics, 
today all the management and finance experts are struggling to predict stock market behavior and many people are wondering that when the theoretical physician and astrophysicist could predict the behavior of the universe and very precisely i think if you could learn something from them we could probably be also be able to predict the stock market behavior and make gains so far we have not been successful but there have been some experts in the field of management which happens to be my discipline where professors of physics have turned into management consultants and have used knowledge of physics to advise companies to become more productive and more profitable uh, one uh, saying that you must have all heard that the strength of the chain lies in the weakest link was given by a physicist and applies very very excessively in the management education uh, in the industry to one industry which was suffering losses uh, the advice of that physicist was that rather than increasing your production you reduce your production and by studying the whole chain of production he found that the total output of an organization can never exceeds the output of the bottleneck which exists on that chain so if you are attempting to produce more than the bottleneck there are more scraps there are more wastages and there are more uh, inventory tension and therefore you lose your profit so different knowledge uh, help us uh, have a different perspective so i appreciate this idea they say that all programs should be modular and they shall provide multiple entry and multiple exits professor alwalia has been very actively involved when he was setting up this uh, central university uh, in himachal and i think both of these i have admitted there in 2011 i admit that yes. being a new university yes, being a small university uh, it was far more easier then maybe for a hp university which was much larger but then we had implemented we had said uh, in fact uh, in some cases we had to argue with experts uh, either they convinced us or we could convince them so say for example presently there was a feeling that you need to do a bachelor in a particular discipline in order to do masters in that discipline that is the practice that we have in many world class universities you do not see this phenomena so even if you have your uh, masters in physics still you could do your medical education here right in class 12 you have to decide that whether you need to take physics chemistry biology or physics chemistry mathematics to decide that which is whether you want to be engineer or you want to be a doctor so we said that why insist on that you must be so obviously there was an objection that most of the recruitment rule requires that your bachelor should be in the same discipline in which your masters should be we said that okay we inform the student that these are the kind of difficulties which you might face but otherwise you are free so if you are mtech and want to do uh, or if you are btech and want to do ma in english it's okay for us and it so happened that in one of the years one btech student in information technology wanted to do ma in english and all english departments were up in arms against that students no no he is coming to contest election uh, he has political motives how would he know etc uh, and then his career so we had discussion with the student finally the department yielded and he was admitted and you know after doing his masters in english and with his knowledge of information technology this student became a very successful startup uh, uh, where he was applying his information technology knowledge with the english language literature knowledge and doing something remarkable which at that time we as a teacher could not understand what he meant of course 90% of the student would follow the common sense common league would have the herd mentality but those 10% who would do it differently would make a difference for the nation so i am a strong proponent of this multidisciplinarity multiple entry 
multiple exits. When we introduced multiple entry, multiple exits in the Central University of Himachal, people had uh, reservations. In the first convocation, we had only master's program, Professor Ghatak knows. Uh, none of the students availed this option. Nobody exited after two semesters. Idea, the rule was that if you exit after two semesters of the master, you leave with an advanced diploma. Within the next five years, you could come back and continue from third semester. You surrender your advanced diploma and you get your master's degree. So nobody availed. By the time we had second convocation, some 10 students availed this option. So we were curious. We had a meeting of these 10 students. That why? And then they found that these students, while they had taken admission to master's program, they were also simultaneously appearing or preparing for various competitive examinations for job. Some for UPSC, some for probationary officers of the bank, some for insurance sector. And these 10 students had got a job. Two at that time in ECG, some in as a probationary officers in the state bank and a few other banks, one in shipping corporation of India. Had this option of multiple exit not available, these students would have left the university because job was more important to them than to continue their masters. But they would be treated as drop out, worth nothing, failure. But with this option available, they left the university gracefully with advanced diploma in our hand. I am very sure that a few, particularly those who had joined the public sector, may have taken their study leave and come back to pursue their master's degree qualification. So in terms of content, they are saying that let there be liberal arts component. Now, the only problem is that the liberal arts definition in America and the liberal arts definition uh, in our country could be quite different. But I think uh, even if you take that, you provide people with options to study many different things. So, and there could be something like values, like communications, like, uh, uh, certain dimensions, uh, some history, some geography, some politics, uh, in a true sense of politics, of course, uh, then it makes people holistic. So like uh, this time we were conducting interviews for admissions to MBA program and the vice chancellor's nominee was a professor of Hindi. So obviously she said that she does not know much about management, but she knows about Hindi and all of you must have uh, studied Hindi up to 10th class, either you were CBSC or UP board or whatever board. And she started asking small, small questions about different poets, about Sufis, about Kabir, Rahim, Raskan. And not that they were from Kerala or Andhra or Tamil Nadu, uh, even a student from UP. Uh, I mean, they had difficulty in recalling uh, these poets or one of their dohas or one of their uh, uh, similes or anything. Uh, we don't want these kind of people. I mean, a holistic personality who could speak, who could talk about in a larger perspective. Anyway, finally, you as a physicist know that no problem, not only of the world, but even the personal problem that we face cannot be solved by the knowledge of a single discipline. You need to apply knowledge of many disciplines to find a solution to those problems. So do you think that the energy problem could be solved only by the scientist or engineer? I think we would be mistaken. It involves a lot of sociology, it involves a lot of development, it has many implications on environment. So I agree to this idea and I hope that it will be implemented in the right spirit. Now in terms of the duration flexibility, the policy I read said about that the UG program could be three or four years. 
and those who have done three years of UG would be required to do two years master's and those who would do four years bachelor would do one year master. That was creating some anxieties. Now recently I read, and that is where I find that many people are interpreting policies in a different way. Perhaps the way which they either find more practical or perhaps they find it more convenient to apply. So uh, I recently saw one document where it says that UG program could be three years only for those who do not want to pursue higher education. But those who wants to pursue master's degree, they need to do this three years bachelor plus one years of bachelor research. And then they would be eligible either for direct admission to PhD or to a one year master program. So I think they are still trying to understand and evolve this process. In the meantime, I'm saying phenomena that most universities, and pardon me saying so, that sometimes uh, worst of the universities are claiming that they have implemented the national education policy in totality. And I find some of the best universities are still saying that I am struggling to understand and to comprehend the, the implications of various recommendations. So I think everybody is doing its own experimentation. Lastly, this policy talks about a seamless mobility of students. And there they are saying that let there be a possibility that a student should not be bound within the domain of a single university, leave him free to accumulate credit from other places. So initially they said that, okay, you can take up to 20% credit from SWEM. Later on, that was extended to 40%. Now SWEM has been extended to taking courses from other MOOCs, national and international. Not officially as yet, but many students are taking. Then that got extended to tech, edu tech companies. In fact, coupons were distributed uh, that people could take courses. So now there are Ola and Uber kind of uh, aggregators in education. So they are educational technology companies. Uh, they tie up with many universities and uh, they provide a possibility to a student that you can take this university from Chicago, you can take this university, this course from Princeton, you can take this course from the Indira Gandhi National Open University or from MOOCs. So they don't own any university, they don't run any university, but they have like uh, Ola and Uber don't own any car, but they run so many taxis. So that is the model that is emerging and is being discouraged. And to facilitate the process, the document had mentioned and now some draft has been mentioned and there are again somewhat questions about these dimensions that they are saying that, okay, let there be an academic bank of credits. So those of you who deal in the share market, so you open a depository account. So this will be like a depository accounts. In fact, this is being to be opened by the National Depository Corporation. Each student shall have this account. And the student would be free to accumulate credit from any of these sources and deposit these courses. And much earlier, some people were saying that there are some people who have prior knowledge acquired by themselves. So most of the way in which we use our PCs and computers I think uh, we were never taught in our schools, uh, but presently we know how to use it. Uh, many spreadsheets or many programs, many languages. So these are the self-acquired prior knowledge. So maybe it will also include those prior knowledges. In the skill, there is already a provision. So a son of a Halwai could score that, okay, I was uh, spending time with my father in the shop and I know how to make jalebis and therefore, this is my prior acquired knowledge. So they can deposit these knowledge and then they can approach a university saying that evaluate these qualifications and grant me a degree. I have accumulated these credits 
and I think I have learned enough to practice surgery. So give me the MS qualification and degree, and it will be to that institutions to evaluate and to decide. Now the questions are being raised about the variations in the quality of the institutions uh, as to how to uh, decide that which credit to accept, et cetera, or not. So I think every university has to apply its mind uh, to decide on these. I would conclude by saying that uh, when Corona started, and I think the focus now is shifting on digital. So I think massive boost is being given to online education, digital education. And uh, when Corona pandemic started, we all shifted to uh, online education. And what Corona did in three months was much more than what the technology companies failed to do in 10 years. So now everybody thinks that the technology is the future. I don't see that phenomena in the world-class universities anywhere in the world. So if MIT today has a teacher-student ratio of one is to eight, their vision document says that they will reduce this ratio to one is to five. So all those world-class universities which are focused on becoming producers of knowledge, they are seeing technology as an aid, as a help, either for improving quality or assisting teachers in better delivery, but they simultaneously keep on focusing on having more and better qualified teachers. On the other hand, many countries, and unfortunately we are also falling into that increasingly, which are focused only on becoming consumers of knowledge, they can say that, okay, there is too much shortage of teachers. Uh, and uh, since we cannot have as many teachers, so let us have technology and online education to provide. Them. So this policy also mentions several times that the access would be improved, equity would be improved by use of technology, by use of online education. And now you all must have come across with the digital university idea that digital university would award degree, but may have perhaps some kind of a distributed network, details are still not available, may not have a bricks and mortar structure. So I will finally conclude that two years ago when the corona started, there was a Spain-based uh, people, they wanted to bring out a volume on future of higher education and online and drawing up a very futuristic uh, scenario of higher education. So I initially sent them a piece and their word limit was only about 650 words. So I initially sent them a paper that nothing would uh, change. Uh, history tells us that uh, the university revert back as soon as the circumstances are conducive to their old manner. So during 15th, 16th, 17th century, when the Black Death Plague was very common, so the moment it would strike, that was a pandemic, universities in Europe would close down and a student and teacher would migrate to manor houses, which are the big large houses of the landlords there, and the teaching, learning, etc., would start there. But as soon as the pandemic would be over, people would revert back to their universities, Oxford, Cambridge, and whatever. In fact, some people say that some of the most remarkable work of the Newton, I think you as a scientist would uh, very uh, correct me or vouch for me, some of his most productive work was that when he was spending his time in a manor house during one of those plagues. But today, none of those manor houses have become academies or research academies. The universities came back. Coming back to India, in the last uh, 1919 Spanish flu, although wrongly named, it did not originate from Spain. It had originated from elsewhere, but because of the World War, none of the countries were reporting it. 
Spain was the only neutral country at that time or one of the neutrals. So they reported. So it affected India. It is spread from a ship in Mumbai. It spread India up to Kolkata from west to east. Uh, for the first time, the population of India declined. So if you compare the census of 1921 with 1911, you will find that population of India had declined. But during 1911 and 21, the number of universities had increased. And none of the universities were any way different than the universities, the way they were operating prior to 1990. So I said that nothing would change. Universities would come back to the way they were. So they did not decide to publish that. They said, okay, it is good, maybe it's, but it's too realistic. We want futuristic. So then I wrote another piece and I would like to share that with you very briefly, that that futuristic piece was that uh, five years down the corona, the disease was still not under control. Six monthly vaccinations were needed gatherings, etc. were still discouraged. Uh, so teaching, etc. were all online. All the barriers to digital access were taken care. Man-made son took care of the energy needs. So no need to take wire to every remote village. It was the sunset. Uh, the data was beamed. Maybe 9G data was beamed from stations or satellites from space, the data banks were set up uh, there. Some very rich people migrated to Mars, which was in fact, uh, uh, what do you call in science, terrified, or uh, uh, moons and so on and so forth. And therefore everybody was learning digital. And then said, okay, why have so many universities? free people from different universities. So re remove the intake capacity. So intake capacity was removed. So people migrated from bad universities to best universities because the best universities did not have any capacity constraints. So the bad universities either closed down or turned into skill development center or knowledge upgradation centers. Then it was said that why only from within the country you allow people to take courses from anywhere, it's available. Teachers constraint is not there, humanoids, robots, they could all teach artificial intelligence now has the capacity of respond to your questions intelligently, could design a course. So you do that. So you started doing this. So at the national level, there became a national higher education qualification authority, which would evaluate all qualifications. So there would be no need for any university. And then why at a national level? So let there be a, such a body at the universe level. So everybody was getting this qualification approved and recognized from the universal higher education qualification authority. There was no need to apply for research through artificial intelligence and machine learning processes. These systems and structures and these social media data would in fact identify people based on their interest of publication and the quality of publication and the feedback that they get and the impact that they have, that these are the pool of people who are available and they could be given these kinds of research. In fact, the system itself would tell you what are the priority areas of research. But anyway, finally, I had culminated that uh, suddenly I woke up because my students were asking that we are waiting in the class, would you take the class? So I think these are the policies, these are some of the technological uh, opportunities, and these are some of the challenges that we have. My apologies if I have not offered you any solution to your implementation challenges. Solution has to come from each universities. Any solution that comes from any single authority would per se be a bad solution, would not take into account the uh, diversity of the country, requirements of the country, the ground realities of the country. So thank you very much for the opportunities. 
and thank you very much to much to, to professor Aya, to professor ghatak in particular i think today i saw him after a gap of maybe seven or eight years but i was extremely delighted and so happy to uh, present my uh, lecture while he was chairing the session thank you very much thank you so much sir over to you kampe um, yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much for enlightening the audience with such a knowledgeable lecture. It is indeed an excellent and elaborative information about NEP. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation and sparing your valuable time for sharing your knowledge about this NEP 2020. Now, sir, I can see a uh, little bit questions in the chat box. So uh, with your permission, may I take the questions? Go by your time. I have nothing else to do. Okay, sir. Thank you. The first question is from uh, Mr. Abhishek Kumar. In present scenario, teacher is the only mechanical tool for all domain in education. What are the factors or any solutions which have been included in NEP 2020? Uh, NEP does emphasize on the importance of teacher. So I must admit Kasturi Rangan committee was a bit more specific. It said that put a ban on these uh, contractual and the guest faculty appointment, let people be appointed on regular basis. I am a great proponent for that. Professor Alwalia is witness to that. And I think uh, Professor Ghatak had also seen this because the matter had gone to various university authorities. In Central University, when we started uh, 20 programs, so initially we uh, advertised those faculty positions to be filled up on contractual basis because the visitors nominee had not come and we wanted to start the program. For about 140 uh, posts or 120 posts, uh, we received about 600 applications. With lot of difficulty, we could select only 15. That was the kind of application. But a year after, when the same positions were advertised on full-time regular basis, we had close to 7,000 applications. We had sympathy with the people who had already taught for one year. And in order to accommodate them, we wanted the seat to application ratio of one is to 20 in which we would call. So for every post of assistant professor, we called 20 people. Even then, out of those 15, some seven could not become eligible. So that tells on the quality of application that you receive when you advertise on full-time basis. When the selection happens, only two of those 15 could finally make it in the final selection. Everybody else who came, they came from every from the length and breadth of the country. So contractual, short-term, ad hoc arrangements, they do not attract quality. And then under popular pressure, sympathetic consideration, then you try to regularize them. That uh, creates problem. I've been vice chancellor of a university where out of 900 faculty positions, and you are all aware of University of Rajasthan, which was at one point in time pioneer. Uh, in fact, like your association of physics teachers, uh, I think they had done some innovations on physics teaching in the University of Rajasthan long time ago. So out of 900 sanctioned positions, 400 positions were vacant. Out of 500 which were filled up, 400 people had never faced any selection committee in their life. Now, so that caused problems. So education policy and particularly the Kasturi Rangan committee emphasized on need of quality teachers. In reality, I do not see that happening. There are at least 10 states that I know where they have made a policy. And I think unless Himachal has corrected it right now, it included Himachal, which had a policy that they will first recruit people only on contractual basis for five years. 
And after five years, they will decide that they need to be regularized or not. And I know that people made it on contractual basis. And then in the five years, they will teach less and spend more time with the politicians drawing some kind of promise that, okay, when they will come to power, they will be regularized and so on and so forth. So teachers are critical in terms of number, in terms of quality, in terms of commitment, in terms of their dedication, in terms of uh, uh, their innovativeness, uh, in terms of uh, continuously upgrading their knowledge, I think all of these things are critical and important. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Mr. Dharmveer Arya. He just wanted to ask the language preference in the NEP 2020 is English only or Hindi as well? You see, uh, initially when the document came, some people thought that okay, Hindi is being imposed, but then it was clarified that no, Hindi is not being imposed. Then came the practical uh, uh, implementations. So they said that, okay, people could do it either in English or in regional languages. In fact, uh, in AICT permitted uh, engineering education in Tamil, Telugu, Andhra, I think 13 or 14 languages. People raised this question uh, about the non-availability of journals and the text in those languages. Then AICT came up with an AI tool where people could uh, use those tools to translate phrases and words and technical terminologies. And now in some of the IITs, they started some regional. So they said that, okay, if you are located in I Madras, Chennai, some seats would be offered for Chennai medium uh, engineering education. So that has already happened. So not necessarily Hindi, but across many different languages. So even in this CU ET to which uh, Professor Ghatak referred to initially, uh, uh, again, that is again a very supple interpretation of the policy. Policy nowhere says a compulsory. It said that there should be some common principle of a test uh, for admission to higher education. They conceptualized NIT, uh, NTA, though NTA existed before, at least five years before when the policy came, but they said that it will be autonomous body, it will be an expert body, uh, and they will conduct quality test. And it will motivate other universities also to join. Uh, and then they said okay, it will be left to individual universities to join uh, the test or not. But now it has been made mandatory for all central universities, all 45 of them, for UG. For PG, they said it will be voluntary, but then the notification from the NTA said that a good number of central universities have already opted in favor of the CUET even for PG admission. So there, there are examinations to be conducted in 13 languages. So including uh, Hindi. In addition to English and their mother tongue, there is an option that, okay, they could also qualify a test in another language. So this is the situation that exists as of now. Okay, sir, thank you. Next is the question from Mr. Dharmnath. Can a student of history, which is having a major subject, can take physics as a minor subject? I mean, the uh, theoretically, yes. And I would prefer that, yes, let it be. Uh, maybe this person would have to work harder to learn the basics of the physics, or maybe he has already learned harder. Uh, and uh, maybe he would turn now to become a historian of science or something like this. Uh, we have very few people in the country to do that, but much would depends on the guidelines. The CBCS guideline, which had earlier come from UGC, to my mind was more restrictive. So it bound universities within a particular framework. Globally, the practice is free these students to make their own baskets. So let them choose. Let us not impose. And I think the essential argument was 
that the earlier thought was that it is only people who either have no hair or all gray hair, they have all the wisdom to guide people. Later on with the uh, technology explosion, with the knowledge explosion, with the student becoming more tech savvy than the seniors, and then above all, as the democracy deepens, everybody who is 18 has got equal rights. So many countries in the world thought that, okay, if they could decide who should their representative be in the parliament and the state assembly, if they can take such a major decision, why not give them freedom to take a decision about what to study and why to study? Uh, maybe they will commit some mistakes, but such a flexible system would allow them to also correct their mistakes, correct their errors. So I would favor yes, but much would depend on the way the guidelines come. Uh, presently, what has happened is that in the absence of the new regulation, the UGC is, is stepping into uh, and is coming up with guidelines and regulations. Almost on a daily basis, we are getting a new regulation. Very difficult to keep track. Thank you so much, sir. Except these questions, all are the appreciations in the chat box. I'm so grateful. <laughs> Thank you so much for graciously answering the participants' uh, queries. Um, now I request Professor P.K. Aluwalia, sir, the president IAPT, to share his views about today's lecture. Aluwalia, sir, before you give, uh, Alwali, sir, before you give your uh, Professor Ghatak uh, about this Nasi, in uh, when I was in planning commission, there was uh, one of my senior colleague, uh, Professor Amitabh Bhattacharya. So he was <laughs> IIT graduate, and then he started uh, post retirement writing. And uh, he would either write a review of the scientific work or he would review the contribution, particularly of Bengal and uh, other things. So, of course, Meghna Saha was one of his uh, favorite founder of this. So, in this process, uh, he found that when Justice Shah Suleiman, who was the youngest High Court Justice of uh, Allahabad High Court, and the first Indian judge of the federal court, at that time the Supreme Court did not exist, and was twice an honorary vice chancellor. So when he died, C.V. Raman wrote uh, his obituary in Nature. So it was surprising that why should Nature publish an obituary of uh, a advocate or a judge? And then he explored further, and then he found that this Justice Shah Suleiman was one of the founder members of Nasi. Oh, and, uh, and then that is why I thought I mentioned uh, Justice Suleiman happened to be our distant relative, same family clan. Uh -huh. uh, so he, uh, during that course, he used to discuss with me. Uh, so, uh, and then he was a professor of mathematical science at Aligarh Muslim University before becoming vice oh, president. I see. And I had he, heard his name, but I did not know that that he was one of the founders. I know some of the founders. Nilatan Dhar was a founder member. Professor Meghna Saha was, of course, the main initiator. And initiator. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, uh, he was one of the founder. And then he was a regular contributory to the journal which Meghna Saha used to publish, Science and Society. And in fact, two pieces he wrote in that journal, which was a critique of Einstein's theory of relativity. So, <laughs> so I think that is a kind of holistic person that by training you are a lawyer, by temperament you are an academician, uh, you are a mathematical science uh, expert, you are known nationally and internationally. I think that breed is dying down. And I think if this national education policy could revive this, that would be the biggest achievement. Uh, yes. Sorry, Anwar Sahib. I mean, it's very useful information, very useful information. The point that you mentioned is very profound that, you know, when you advertise for Say, say, even 100 position of assistant professor of physics, let us suppose. And you will get 7,000 applications. And not all of them are very good, but most of them, 
people learn people do when they come to a that is my main concern that is my main concern that uh, there are so many people who want to take up basic science mathematics even biology and the greatest example that we see as was pointed out by someone that you know is 26000 people in you i never th- knew before this war that there are 26000 uh, uh, young students who are studying in a place like you ukraine and uh, so and then lakhs and lakhs are there in china and uh, so we must uh, uh, we must expand our universities and colleges in a very big way and my recipe is that you appoint at the top the right person and give them a free hand and this has been validated by people like homi bhaba vikram sarabhai and satish dhawan and many others i don't know so I'm sometimes sorry. and sometimes if you have to make exception do the exception yes. again somebody told me and i think you can vouch that when ashutosh mukherjee was appointed as vice chancellor at that time the rule was that nobody can draw a salary more than what the district collector used to draw <laughs> and then that was not a salary at which uh, they could offer this job to ashutosh mukherjee so they made exception uh, <laughs> in case of but where are those kinds of exceptions not only that there? there is another thing since you mentioned sir ashutosh mukherjee you see look at the vision professor cv raman when he appointed him as a palit professor he did not have a phd but he saw the brightness in that person and he appointed him as a palit professor he not only appointed him but he also appointed people like vignat saha satyendranath bose and uh, prashant mahalanavis who eventually became such great so you see you have to give the freedom up uh, this is an uh, <laughs> this is uh, opening uh, lekin uh, lekin what i am most concerned about today is the following that when a bright young man or a woman a girl comes to me when he or she is in the school he sir mai physics karna chahte bataiye kya karu i do not have a straight answer to that i do not have a straight answer to that and that is the uh, after 50 years of teaching in a premier institution i just do not know because the jobs have become so scarce so there has to be a massive expansion and there is a room and and there is another thing that i would like to mention that you see today a parent spends thousands of rupees lakhs in 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 putting him or her to a pub, to a, a, a public school and when he goes to delhi university or or central university or something like that the salary is the 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 tuition is very low i mean you have to generate money <laughs> the government needs money that is so look these are these are uh, endless talks and uh, i am hopeful i am i am an optimist i am an optimist but uh, chalo sorry no it was pleasure sir over to you prasad walia thank you very much and uh, i think uh, uh, we had an excellent session today we could not have asked for more when i talked to professor ghatak to please join us uh, he really was saying that okay mai dekhunga join karne ke bare mein <laughs> but sir we are grateful that you joined and you uh, set the tone of this session itself if i may put it like that and uh, i think uh, that is where uh, we need such forums where we should sit down and listen very very carefully that what is actually happening sir one slide which i really would like to mention in your lecture was the slide of uh, verges uh, korean and uh, i was reading a book published by nasi in which 
he went for getting a degree in metallurgy but did a minor course in uh, dairy engineering dairy engineering okay and when he came back he adopted that as a profession uh, then going for the metallurgical engineering itself i think that book itself is very 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 informative book when people were asking me to give a lecture on this uh, 75 years of uh, indian uh, independence i really picked up and i have made uh, a lecture 75 impactful years of indian science and technology on human development and varghis kurian is one of my favorites to talk about in that lecture <laughs> uh, so thank you very much sir for really joining us and staying all in all of the lecture that's your blessing i would say and uh, when we started this series sir the first name which came to our mind was our professor furkan kamar i know him from himachal i was knowing his dedication and the kind of uh, approach he has got towards higher education so i was willing that he should have delivered us the first lecture <laughs> but i think i am i am grateful that he gave us such a wonderful lecture and uh, sir thank you very much for telling us that if you are going to tread the path of new education policy 2020 then what are you going to find on the way and that is the best part of it because sometimes we get into something and we don't know what we are going to get on our way itself it was a very very comprehensive uh, uh, i would say elaboration of new education policy 2020 and uh, you really read for us something which is there between the lines of national education policy because your flow chart which formed the basis it was so comprehensive that i think we would love to really share that flow chart with our iapt members also that this is you know how you should look at it <laughs> and uh, the way you brought in your experience into whole of this uh, format and uh, uh, you have been during that period when himachal pradesh university was also trying to uh, introduce choice based credit system it is indeed a very very challenging thing it's not an easy thing and i always wonder we will will we have really the resources for implementing 20, uh, national education policy 2020 government has been saying that we will give 6% of the gdp but i don't know whether it is going to come or not one thing which i can mention is this that when rusa came rashtriya uchchatar shiksha abhiyan i think that has really made a, a distinct change in the infrastructure of the colleges and the universities that is now visible if you come to himachal you will find that that infrastructure has really come up but then when it comes to you know uh, saying that faculty from where the faculty is going to come uh, answer is in fact not coming there fortunately sir now in himachal pradesh that time of uh, uh, what you call contractual appointment has been reduced to 3 years and i was talking to someone why don't you call it provisionary period then calling it as a contractual appointment give them salary right from the very beginning which they deserve uh, but then there are aberrations which really happen and sometimes you know we sitting in the universities are not taking decisions somebody else from the top takes decision and then you know everything becomes a kind of a thing from which it is very difficult to recover uh, i think that is something also which we have to really keep in mind third thing about numbers sir i am really uh, sometimes uh, wondering that why himachal pradesh university after 50 years of its establishment only has 6000 students on its campus why not we have around 20000 students in one campus itself which will help it to be more Uh, viable financially also, and it will make it truly interdisciplinary. Uh, and it is, it is actually that is how I think that kind of a structure which is being talked about in national education policy to reduce uh, institutions from current uh, number to around fifteen thousand is really desirable. That maybe in one city where a university comes up becomes a university city itself, and there is a focused approach to doing the thing even cluster university is a good idea but uh, sometimes in a 
place like himachal pradesh or in arunachal the numbers also also become uh, you know population is less we cannot have all such things here but i believe that uh, uh, the discussion which national education policy has uh, generated uh, i am told that we are th- uh, reviewing our national curriculum framework for schools for national curriculum framework for colleges that what we are actually supposed to do in it i think we are still making our mind though we are into it for almost two years now so hopefully something best will come but i believe that organizations like iapt has a role to play in enlightening their members and making them see that what innovations they can bring in the new scenario and that was the reason sir we thought uh, that we should have this uh, kind of uh, lecture series and we wish to have these lecture series on minute details of the national education policy that how it is going to impact subjects like physics itself we would like to and how physics can really be a kind of a subject which a history student would like to really study a uh, professor ghatak knows that uh, he is an expert in quantum mechanics b brogli was a historian to begin with am i right sir uh, when he gave us d brogli's formula so those possibilities we should really look into and uh, think about i am very very thankful to professor ghatak uh, professor fukan kamar professor kedar singh Uh, professor seema watts uh, prof dr poonam jain dr yogesh uh, our uh, uh, coordinator uh, professor uh, manish uh, kashyap ji and i think whole team of regional council uh, 01 uh, uh, delhi and haryana that they immediately said that he want we want to do it and sir this these lectures are available on the youtube also and i think we are going to circulate uh, this lecture particularly in our uh, um, groups where wherever we are and we will share that also with you because uh, it's very rare that we find uh, people uh, uh, coming out with such an exposure which you have given to us uh, with folded hands once again sir i thank you on behalf of iept for giving us your very very precious time Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Alwali. It Thank was a great much. pleasure to attend. Sorry, sorry. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Alwali, sir, for summarizing in such a nice way. It's always a pleasure to listen from Professor Ajoy Ghatak, sir. But today I am uh, having the opportunity to have the lecture from Professor Fulkan Kamar, sir. Um, thank you so much for enriching us with your words of wisdom, sir. Now I request Professor Manish Kashyap, School of Physical Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University, to propose vote of thanks. Over to you, Manish sir. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Poonam, uh, uh, respected Professor Ajoy Ghatak, uh, President uh, National Academy of uh, Science India, and uh, a former professor of IIT Delhi in physics, Professor uh, Furkan Kamarji. Professor uh, Center for Management Study, Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi, and former Vice Chancellor of Central University of Himachal Pradesh, Professor uh, P K Aluwalia ji, uh, President uh, IAPT, and former P- Professor of Physics at H P University Shimla, Professor Kedar Singh ji, Dean S P S J N U, and Dr. Poonam Jain, moderator for today's session, all other member of organizing panel today, my. other colleagues from gnu and iapt all the listener who were en- enlightened today by the two wonderful talks by professor uh, uh, ghatak and professor kamar uh, good afternoon to all of you it's my proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of all the organizer of nep lecture series and my own behalf today in this sixth lecture of our nep lecture series first of all i extend my very hearty vote of thank to today's chief guest professor ajoy ghatak who have accepted our invitation to be the chief guest and to give his presidential remark for me it was really a great day sir as till date i have uh, learned from professor ghatak only through his books and online lectures but today i have got the opportunity to listen him live uh, although virtually 
but on a very important topic of uh, present uh, time, that is the National Education Policy 2020. He started his lecture with very beautiful, uh, very beautiful, very beautifully by for creating the interest of the listener, listener in, in Indian education system, and uh, uh, to think and do more and more good for uh, the growth of the educational system of India. He told us about the first college of India, that is the Hindu college in uh, Calcutta, which was built by Raja Ram Mohan Rai Ji on uh, uh, 20th uh, January 1817 with 20 scholars, which was later renamed as Vidinshi College and uh, renowned personalities of India like uh, J.C. Bose Ji and Prafulla Chandra Rai Ji were the asset of this college. And uh, in uh, 20, 20, uh, 2010, uh, it was uh, finally got the uh, 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 status of university like uh, presidency university. He spoke continuously in the same direction and it introduced all the other institutions of India which remain pioneer from the past to the present day. All, all of these institutions are playing big role in the development of our country and according to him, Understanding of NEP is very important at present. Uh, now the competition is so severe, the pressure on the student to be successful is tremendous. And uh, we have to create more and more colleges of repute so that there, uh, there remains no such a great competition among the students. Okay, so thanks for your words, sir. Uh, coming to the next, we are fortunate today to have uh, Professor Furkan Kamars uh, from Jamia Milia Islamia New Delhi today. And uh, thank you, sir, for spending your time with us. It was really a wonderful experience for us. And uh, everyone knows uh, his topic was roadmap for implementation of NEP 2020. And definitely we saw a roadmap. Within one single slide, we saw all the explanation. It was new learning experience, sir. And at least I have never listened to such a talk going in, in such an innovative fashion. Thank you for in your initiative, sir. And uh, like uh, you can say, tree has branches and branches have more and more branches. All are connected and depending on, on each other. That's what uh, we saw in today's uh, presentation for explaining the real meaning of NEP 2020, connecting various factors by each other. You told uh, us by 2035, uh, all the institution will be reclassified as uh, research university, teacher university, and uh, autonomous higher education institutes and uh, all will be known for a specific task as per their status. The national education policies focuses more on uh, to make the all the institution to be multidisciplinary and offer more and more option to the students. So just a science college, commerce college or art college will not solve the purpose. All the branch, all the colleges should come uh, within a single college and it is possible if we can think within a city uh, to make the cluster of the college and rename it as a university. In one college, student can uh, read science. In other, uh, uh, he can read commerce. Similarly, some other subject, subject in separate college, in other separate colleges. So in other words, you can say that different colleges uh, have to emerge. This can be made uh, the real sense of multidisciplinary institute. Uh, no problem in the world cannot be solved by uh, cannot be solved by the knowledge of a single discipline that that you particularly mentioned, sir. Uh, so for an institution, it is very important to be multidisciplinary. Uh, finally, he concluded that when Corona has started, the massive boost was given to the digital education, in fact, the online education. And now we are we have understood completely that technology is the future. For technology announcement, the teacher ratio should be improved in our institution. He has taken the example of MIT USA, where the uh, uh, student teacher ratio is uh, one ratio eight at, at this time. And they are planning to reduce it uh, to be one ratio five, to be more product, uh, productive. Uh, so ultimate aim of uh, the institution uh, uh, is that it should be the producer of the knowledge. Thank you again for your elaborative talk, sir. And next, uh, we have uh, Professor P. K. Luvalia, who is always brilliant to talk on the issues of national education policy. Today, he concluded both the talk in the precise manner and presented the glimpse of uh, both the talks. Thank you, sir, for supporting us today. And always, you are always source of inspiration for all the uh, young students and, and your colleagues. Thanks is also due to Dr. Vijay and Dr. Alok 
from SPS JNU for introducing our chief guest and eminent speaker respectively. And the extreme co uh, cooperation from the team of SPS JNU and uh, IAPT is highly acknowledged. Most of all, I would like to thank all the participants, listeners who have listened today's talk on Zoom and uh, uh, YouTube patiently. So we hope it was a real uh, fruitful experience, uh, learning experience for all of you uh, in order to understand the impl uh, implementation of NEP 2020. Thank you all. And finally, I give the mic to Dr. Poonam Jain again. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, vote of thanks. Today's event, a resounding success, has approached its completion again. Before signing off formally, a big thank you to the audience for showing interest and make this event a great success. With an announcement, the attendance link is shared in the chat box. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of this lecture. And we will meet again on the next Saturday, which is the last lecture of this series. So till then, stay tuned. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Have a great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Poonam. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Katak sir. Thank you, uh, Kumar sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. everyone. Thank you so much.